preach today is the purpose of his coming and to encourage us in the word of God. But uh, Brother Blau pastored some churches when he was younger. And then for, I think you said, 20, 26 years or something, he's been involved in missionary evangelism where he's all the time preaching in churches in the States, but then also taking trips to other countries and being with missionaries and preaching for them. And sometimes preaching in evangelistic meetings or sometimes teaching in, in Bible colleges or whatever. And uh, the Lord has been opening up more and more doors. The older he's got, the more opportunities I think he's getting. <laughs> and uh, so we're very blessed and, and uh, glad to have him here with us today. We've supported him as a missionary in, in his work for the last 15, 20 years, something like that. And we're glad that he could be with us. And his wife is with us. Uh, she's never been here before. So uh, grateful to have him. You come and he's going to speak to us here this morning. I need to attach this to you. There we go. All right. Thank you, sir. What time do you normally uh, finish Sunday school? Um, 1040 to 1045. Maybe. Okay. All right. Thank you for being here today. And uh, as Pastor already mentioned, I'm Brother James Belisle, my wife, Linda. Uh, we will be married 44 years at the end of this week, uh, the 30th of June. We'll have 44 years of marital blitz. I mean, bliss. <laughs> Um, no, we have been married for 44 years uh, and on the 30th of this month, and she has been the one that has kept me in the ministry, really. Uh, us guys like to think that, boy, we're strong for the Lord, but uh, when you have a wife that encourages you and that uh, believes in you, uh, then it's a lot easier to serve the Lord. And that's what my wife has been to me. She has always been an encouragement. She's never held me back from serving the Lord. I remember after I took my first missions trip, I was still a pastor. I had no intention of being a missionary evangelist. I didn't even know what it was. And uh, so I took my first missions trip and I came back and, and I told my wife, I said, I couldn't explain what I experienced. It was just, uh, you know, I, I, I pastored in a small town of 22 houses. And I went to a big city in Nigeria, Ibadan, and I saw all those people. And it just captured me. And I thought, I came back and I sat down with my wife. I said, why sit we here till we die? I mean, we had the American dream. We, I mean, we, we purchased a house. We'd been praying for 13 years. And God allowed us to buy this house. And we had an acre of land. We even had a white picket fence. And in America, that's, you know, that's the American dream. And uh, we had it almost all paid off. But I came back and I said, why sit we here till we die? There's just so many people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if God called me. I just volunteered. I just said, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And I'll work with whatever missionary that you want me to work with. And eventually got to know some pastors in those particular uh, uh, countries where I was preaching. And they started inviting me over. And so I've been for 26 years now. I have been preaching and the Lord's allowed me to be in 26 different countries. I've taken more than 70 trips uh, during that time. This year has been very, very busy. Uh, earlier this year, I was in Nigeria and I was preaching soul winning and leadership conferences there. And then I was able to go to Mexico and I was able to preach for a young man that just started a church about three or four years ago in Guadalajara, Mexico. And already he's averaging over 200 people and they're building a 600 seat auditorium. I mean, just he's a young man and it just seems like God has brought many, many young couples into his church and they are excited for the Lord. And so they're just expanding, and he allowed me to come and preach their missions conference. And I also preached for another missionary that's been there for 18 years, and he has started four churches in uh, Guadalajara. And uh, just, just a great blessing. And then I was able to go to Central America after that, and I was preaching in Honduras for a man that's been there. I preached his 22nd anniversary of their church in Honduras. They've been faithful. His wife has been through cancer, but they faithfully stayed there and they faithfully served the Lord. And then I preached in El Salvador. Uh, Henry Gonzalez, his wife Tammy, they've been there for 28 years. And uh, COVID hit them hard, hit their church real hard, and they're just now starting to recuperate from 
the lockdowns and things like that. Uh, but I had a chance to preach for them. And then I was also in Guatemala. And I preached for a young man, uh, Daniel Wilder and his family. And uh, they've been there for, I believe, 16 years, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, God's blessed their uh, efforts there. They're actually building a second story at their church building. And they're trying to get it finished this year. What I'm trying to say is I've been to a lot of different countries and I've preached for a lot of different missionaries that have been in different stages of their ministry. And it's just been a blessing for me to be here at this church. This church has supported my ministry, like Pastor said, for about 15 years. And the reason I raised support in America primarily, of course, Canada, this is a Canadian church that supports me, but uh, in the United States of America is where I get most of my support. And the reason I raise that support is so that I can offer my services to missionaries and to pastors in these countries, and they don't have to worry about the travel expenses. I take care of all that. If I stay in a hotel, I take care of that. And that way they just know that, I just tell them, I said, if you'll just feed me, and they see that I'm not real big, so they think they can do that. <laughs> they think that feeding me will not break the bank, you know. And uh, so that's, that's what I do is I just offer my services free. And I take care of all the uh, expenses. And I told the Lord when I first started this, I said, God, as long as you fund me, I said, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And uh, sometimes the Lord has given me one time, uh, I'm just telling you a little bit about my ministry and we'll get into, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 78 and we'll get right into the uh, message there. But um, uh, one time my, my mom passed away. I'm glad it was only one time. I mean, it would have been really crazy if she passed away twice. Amen. But uh, when my mom passed away, she was not rich and uh, there were eight of us uh, siblings. And so, you know, we divided up the inheritance and it wasn't much. And all of us were just fine financially. We didn't need the inheritance, but that's what she wanted. And so I got a little bit of a, a thing. And for two years, I prayed. I said, God, what do you want me to do with this uh, inheritance that you gave me? I said, Lord, if you want me to use it for your work, I'll do that. And God opened up the opportunity in the Philippines. I see we have some Filipinos here uh, in the service here, or at least you used to be from the Philippines. And, uh, and so God opened up the opportunity for me to be able to oversee a citywide campaign in Mandawi City, Philippines, right next to Cebu City. And uh, I worked with 18 different Filipinos, but you talk about hard workers. Those Filipinos are hard workers. And they did all the work. I gave all the money, so they let me preach. <laughs> That's how it worked. <laughs> and so, but we had a three-day meeting, and uh, I used that inheritance. I just said, Lord, if that's what you want me to do. And so sometimes the Lord's just had me to use my own money to keep the ministry going. I said all that to say it's been a privilege to be used of the Lord, to be serving the Lord. And God can use you. Uh, you don't have to be fancy. You don't have to be a quote-unquote quote, quote, big-name preacher. Like I said, I was pastoring a small church in a little town of 22 houses in the cornfields of Iowa. Well, at least during the harvest season, before they actually harvested the ears of corn, all I had to do was raise all of our windows. And when I was preaching, I was preaching to more ears than anybody else on the face of the earth. Some of you will get that joke here in a minute. Ears of corn. Anyway, uh, so if it takes a while for you to get it, just don't laugh. You just laugh in inwardly to yourself. But anyways, thank you so much for being here. And would you do me a favor, since this church is supporting me, if you would, I've got plenty of brochures. I would like for you to grab one of my brochures. And if you could pray for me. And uh, I'm 68 years old. I'll be 69 this year. God has been very gracious to both of my, my wife and I. But so far, we've had uh, not real serious uh, physical ailments. My wife has experienced a couple of times where she had cancer on her Face. Thankfully, it was not something like melanoma. It was something that could be cared for uh, by simple surgery. And I say simple because it wasn't on me, you know what I mean? But uh, so we're thankful for that. And as far as I know, I still have health. So we're very thankful for how the God has allowed us to do that. But I do need your prayers because I am finding out as I get older that uh, these trips can be very difficult on my body. Uh, I kind of like push my body and push my body and almost every trip my body finally pushes back and says, you're not doing anything today. <laughs> and it says, you are going to rest whether you like it or not. And so I have to. Uh, that's just my body. My body tells me you can't go any further. 
And so that happens almost every trip that I take. But this morning, I want to talk, we're talking about this is your 20th anniversary of this church. If you're a visitor, we're thankful that you are here visiting. But this church has been in existence for 20 years, and God has used this church to reach many people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I prayed about what the Lord would have me to teach. And so today I want to just talk a little bit in Sunday school about preparing the next generation. Preparing the next generation. If this church is going to go forward, then obviously there has to be a transfer from those of us. I'm 68, <clears throat> so I've got to be able to influence somebody younger than me. I'm not the pastor, obviously, of my church, but I've got to influence somebody younger than me. So that as, as I pass off the scene, they're ready to take up the mantle and continue to do the work of God. And so if this church, has, after 20 years, if this church is going to look forward to the future, then they have to realize we have to prepare the next generation for the work of God. So I want us to take Psalm 78, beginning in verse number 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, pray quickly, and then get right into the lesson. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. So notice, the psalmist is saying, I've heard it from Psalm somebody else. So somebody that experienced whatever he's going to be talking about, they told me about God. They told me about the works of God. They told me about how God worked in their life. <clears throat> so that's one generation. <clears throat> the psalmist is a second generation. He received it from somebody else. So he now has with somebody else, and he heard about it anyways, now we continue, verse number four. We will not hide them from their children. <clears throat> so there's the next generation. He says, whatever happened to this previous generation, and they're talking to me, they're influencing me, they're telling me about the God's goodness, they're telling me about God's work, they're telling me about what happened in their lives, what God did in their lives. Now, I'm not going to hide what's going on in my life to the next generation. So are you seeing what the psalmist is saying? I've received it from the previous generation. It has affected my life. God has worked in my life. God has changed my life. I've seen answers to prayer. I've seen God work in my life. Now I want to turn it down. I don't want to hide from the next generation what God's done in my life. Let's continue. Verse number four, he says, we'll, we will not hide them from their uh, ch children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. There's that transfer. So our fathers learned it. God expected them to transfer it to their children. That the generation to come, there's another generation. Are you seeing the transfer? So our fathers heard it. God expected them to tell their children. Why? So that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should not be born. So there's a fourth generation who should arise and declare them to their children. So we see there's five generations that God's talking about here. I've received it from a previous generation. God's worked in my life. God expects me, commands me to transfer that same, what I received, and what God taught me and how God's worked in my life. He expects me to transfer it to my next generation, which is my children, so that they can teach their children and then the ones following them the same thing. And he finishes off in verse number seven. He says that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Father, I pray that once again that you fill me with your power, that you would help me to be able to transfer to these people, your people, Lord, for the future. What you've done in my life, what that's done in their life, so that they might be able to transfer it to the next generation. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, I want you to know, we need to prepare the next generation, how? By praising the Lord for his works in our life. Look at verse number four. He says, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come. The first thing he says is the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. I'll tell you what the next generation needs to 
to see. My children needed to see it and still need to see it. And my grandchildren need to see it. And that is they need to see that I can praise God for what he's done in my life. It's about time that God's people start praising the Lord. We sing a little song. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Our children need to see that God is real in our life and that we are praising Him for everything that He He's done in our lives. God's people ought to be happy people. Now, I'm not talking about personality. I understand everybody has a different personality. And by the way, that personality that you have, God gave it to you. So praise the Lord for that. There's nothing wrong. Uh, Brother Johnson's personality is different than my personality. I'm a Peter. If you look at the Bible, Peter had a chance. He had a, had a problem with putting his foot in his mouth. <laughs> he had a problem with speaking before his mind got put in gear. And he got in trouble. And and I've experienced that, unfortunately. That's my personality. Brother Johnson's much quieter. Uh, Brother Johnson has a per perpetual smile on his face. You never can figure out whether he's really happy or not. <laughs> but uh, everybody has a different personality. So God's not talking about a personality here. But he is saying, look, if you're a child of God, if you've had your sins forgiven, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, if heaven is your home, if your sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, then your children ought to hear you praising Him for the works of God in your life. Forget your personality. They need to hear you praise the Lord. They need to hear you talk about how God has worked in your life. Look, if the generation to come is going to follow in our footsteps, if they are going to believe in the God that we have believed in, if they're going to trust as their Savior the Jesus that we trusted as our personal Savior, then they're going to see, need to see in our lives that Jesus Christ is real, that He does listen to us, that He does does answer our prayers, that he does guide and direct us on a regular basis, that he is real. That's what the psalmist is saying here. He said in verse number four, he says, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. He said, I want to praise the Lord for his strength. Has God been strong in your life? Has the Lord Jesus Christ helped you to go through difficult times? You need to tell your children that. My children have heard about the times when my wife and I first got married and I was still in Bible college. She had already graduated. She's a little bit older than me, three years older than me. She felt sorry for me, so she married me. But anyways... <laughs> My wife is older than me, so she had already graduated, and I was still in, in college, and things went real smooth that first year. I had a good paying job. I was in Bible college. Everything was going just right, and then all of a sudden, I got laid off. Anybody ever got laid off from a job? <laughs> Sir? Nobody likes to get laid off, and all of a sudden, I had no money coming in. And all of a sudden, I was wondering, how am I going to pay the bill? I mean, I'm living off campus. I'm renting. i got to feed my wife. i got to take care of me. And, uh, and I remember I, had, I called up our landlord, and I said, look, I've been laid off. I said, I, I don't know. The, the economy was rough at that time in the United States. There was a lot of people that got laid off. We were in a recession. And I called my, uh, my employer, or excuse me, my uh, uh, rental uh, guy, the landlord, and I said, I don't know how we're going to pay, <clears throat> as I just got laid off. To his credit, he was very gracious. He says, well, we'll see what happens. You just, we'll, we'll wait what happens at the end of the month. And so she saw, and we got down on our knees, and we prayed. And I'll never forget the day that we were praying about, you know, how, how are we going to feed ourselves? And I got a knock on the door, and there was two ladies there, and they had these bags of groceries. And they said, we felt like the Holy Spirit wanted us to bring some food to you. And so we got those things, and we shouted, and we were praising the Lord that He answered our prayers. My children need to hear about that. They need to hear that God provided, that His strength was there for us when we were going through a difficult time. 
They needed to hear how even though we didn't have a lot of money come in and we couldn't afford very much food, this is the God's honest truth. There were times in that, during that period when we sat down at the beginning of the week and we said, okay, we have a choice. We can either get one pound of hamburger or we can get one pound of hot dogs or we can save up a little and maybe get us a, a, a small chicken. And that was the only protein we had other than eggs. That's the only meat that we had for that whole week. This is the truth. I know that everybody thinks that Americans are rich all the time, but, but when we were going through Bible college, that's the way it was for a little while. And what my children need to hear is they need to hear that God took care of us. They need to hear that God answered our prayers. I'm not talking about boasting. I'm not talking about us looking good. I'm talking about the psalmist said they need to see that God is strong on our behalf. That he answers our prayer. That he is real. That we talked to him. We prayed and we got our prayers answered and God provided for us. You see, they need to hear that. And then he says right here for the wonderful works that he hath done. We're still on verse number four. Folks, you need to tell your children and your grandchildren how you got saved. You need to tell them. Uh, I was born and raised a Roman Catholic. I heard all about the, I mean, back when I was a child, they were still doing the mass in Latin. Uh, when I was a child, I took seriously what they were teaching me. I even had a priest come to my home before my dad passed away. So that means it was before I was 13 years old. And I had that priest come and I was seriously considering going to prep school for the ministry, even as a lost individual. It was serious to me. <clears throat> and uh, during my teenage years, it was during the rebellion of the 60s. I was in high school between 1968 and 1972, and everything changed. I remember seeing everything change when I was in high school. And during that period, the church was changing. The Catholic church was changing. All of a sudden, the things they told me that you can't do this, you can't do this, you, you got to do this, you got to do this. All of a sudden, they started changing everything. And as a teenage boy, I remember saying, if they're men and they're changing the rules, when I become a man, I'm going to make up my own rules. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking logically. And so I was, uh, in, I was not enamored any longer with that religion. But then my brother, I have three brothers, and my brother that's eight years older than me, Gerard, he gave me the gospel in letters. He, he lived in, uh, in Delaware, and I lived in New York City at the time. I had already graduated from high school. I was working for the airline industry, and all of a sudden I started receiving these letters from my brother and telling me about Jesus Christ and telling me how I could get saved and telling me about the Bible. And I'm thinking to myself, what happened to my brother? I said, he's gone nuts. He's crazy. He's got religion. He's a Jesus freak. I mean, all these things were going through my mind as a lost individual. And through a year of him preaching the gospel, every letter telling me about Jesus, telling me how to get saved, urging me to go to a Bible preaching church. And finally, when I finally quit my job and went to a secular university, God had a group of Christians just waiting for me. And I ran into a bunch of Christians, and I started going to church with those Christians. And one day I came back home, and I said, man, Lord, I want what they have. And I could hear my brother saying, Jim, all you have to do is trust Christ as your personal Savior. And that night I sat down in my bed, and I said, Lord, if all I've got to do to get what they have is to trust Christ as my Savior, I'm trusting Him right now. And God saved me. My children have heard that over and over again. They heard about how God saved me. They heard about how what transpired leading up to the time that I got saved. My wife was raised hearing the gospel. She went to Bible preaching churches when she was nine years old. She had a faithful Sunday school teacher. There was only three children in that Sunday school class. Class. If God ever uses you to teach people in a Sunday school setting or in a Bible club setting, don't worry about how many you're teaching. You're important. Make sure that you take that seriously. So anyway, she was listening and she taught that teacher taught on you must be born again. Nicodemus, John chapter number three. And she pointed, talk about a confrontational soul when this Sunday school teacher, she pointed at each one of those girls. Have you been born again? <laughs> Have you been born again? Have you been born again? And my little nine-year-old wife-to-be, she said, no, I haven't been born again. <laughs> and she got saved that day. 
She got saved that day. My children have heard that testimony over and over and over again. What was the psalmist saying here? The first thing he said, prepare the next generation by doing what? By praising the Lord for the works of God in your life. Has God worked in your life since you've gotten saved? Look, the greatest work that he ever did in your life is saving you. You are on your way to hell. You are in darkness. You are an enemy to God. That's what the Bible says. These, this is all Bible, by the way. I mean, I could quote, I'm not going to quote scriptures, but you check the Bible out. The Bible says before we're saved, we're enemies of God. Before we're saved, we are in darkness. Before we're saved, we are destined for hell. We're on our way to hell because of our sin. And, but then God brought somebody into your life. It may have been in a church service. It may have been somebody coming to your house. It may have been a faithful Sunday school teacher. I don't know what your circumstances are. But if God saved you, then you need to share that with your children. Because that's the greatest work that God could ever produce in the human heart. Because it is a work of God. It is a supernatural work of God. It is a miracle. Is that, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that God could change a heart from within by simply the Spirit of God coming into that person's heart and changing them from a child of devil to a child of God. From a person in darkness to a person that sees the light. From a person that's an enemy of God to a person that's a friend of God and a child of God. From a person that's filled with sin to a person that no longer any sin is to your account when you get born again. Did you realize that? When you got saved, saved, all your sins were covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. From a person that was dead in their trespasses and sin to a person that's now robed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Folks, if that doesn't excite you enough to share that with your children, you got a problem. You have a problem. And so God says, if we're going to prepare the next generation, the very first thing we need to do is praise the Lord for the work of God in our life. If God's done something in your life, your children need to hear about it. When I got saved, <clears throat> I knew that my family did not hear the things that I was hearing. I knew it because I was raised with them. And so the minute that I got saved, I decided I wanted to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I started talking to my brothers and my sisters and my aunts and my uncles and my relatives and my next door neighbors and the people that I used to hang around with when I was a child and my teachers that I went to high school with. And even the priest, I tried to talk to him about the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and how to get saved. Why? Because God had done a work in my life. And so if you're going to transfer to the next generation, if this church is going to go forward, this church needs to be filled with a bunch of Christians that are praising God for what he's done in their life. And telling their children and their grandchildren. My grandchildren live across, I have five that live across the street from us. They need to see a happy Christian. They need to see a happy grandpa. I know there's problems we have in our society. I know that I have corruption in my government back home. But you know what? My, my grandchildren don't need to hear a grumpy granddad. <laughs> they don't, they don't, every time they come over to the house, they don't need to hear a grandpa that's talking about, well, I don't know what that president's doing. I don't know what these politicians are doing. I don't know how I'm going to make it because of this inflation. They don't need to hear that. They need to hear somebody that's on the top side. They need to hear somebody that has a God that's real. And that's what they need to hear from you. So first of all, we need to prepare the next generation by praising God for the works of God in their life. Number two, we need to prepare them by teaching them the Word of God. Look at verse number five. We're in Psalm 78, Psalm 78, verse number five. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, notice what he commanded them to do, that they should make them known to their children. The second thing we need to do is we need to prepare them by teaching them the Word Word of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you a dad? Are you a mother? Then you need to teach your children the Word of God. You need to teach them the Word of God. My wife, I have a great wife. I wonder, I thank God for my wife. We traveled a lot <clears throat> when I first started this ministry. And so my wife, well, even before we started traveling, she did this, but because they were of school age, she took it upon herself, and they started memorizing whole chapters of the Bible. You know, she started off with smaller chapters. 
but they, she started memorizing. Then when we would learn scripture songs, she would teach them those scripture songs, and I would do it as well. And we would teach them the scripture songs. That's a great way to memorize the Word of God, is to teach them scripture, scripture songs. Children, they'll, they'll, I mean, they will just memorize, they'll grab it just like that. And what was my wife doing? She was teaching them the Word of God. It was up to me as the dad. You know, just like here, God expected the Old Testament saints to teach the Word of God. You know, He says the same thing to us fathers in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the book of Ephesians, he says to us, us uh, fathers, he says, he says, uh, Father, he said, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's my job. Now, my wife did most of the teaching, but it's my job to lead the way. It's my job to read the Bible with them. It's my job to explain the Word of God to them. It's my job to implement biblical concepts into our families. That's my job. It's about time that God's men are the spiritual leaders of the home. It's about time that God's men take that responsibility upon their shoulders and realize I'm going to face God someday for how I train my children. Oh yes, if we're saved, we're going to be going to heaven. I know that. But when we face the Lord, we're not facing Him for our sin. And we're not facing Him whether or not we're going to go to heaven. But we are facing Him. What did we do with the time He gave us while we were still on this earth? Did we serve Him? Did we take, train our children? Did we love our wives? Men, do you love your wife? I'm not just talking about physically. I'm talking about do you love your wife? True love is more interested in the needs of the person you love. It's not about what she does for me. Am I interested in what she needs? Am I fulfilling her needs? Am I protecting her? Am I guiding her biblically? Am I being the spiritual leader so I can say to her, God spoke to my heart, God taught me something in this book, and this is why we're going to go forward in our family, because God showed it to me in the Bible. I'm not talking about some you know, weird feeling or some vision or something like that. I'm talking about God has given us what we need in this book right here. Men, let's be spiritual men. Let's be the spiritual leaders in the home. If we expect our, our wives to follow us, give them something to follow. <laughs> Boy, it's quiet in here. <laughs> give them something to follow. Give them a spiritual leader. Give them somebody that loves God. Give them somebody that reads it. You, let me ask you a question. Do you read this book every day? You know, I eat three meals a day. Sometimes two, but most of the time I eat three meals a day. You know why? Because I need energy. I need physical energy. And yet God's people, Christians, God's people somehow think that they can go daily without getting their spiritual food. And that's why you're failing in your life. That's why you're not the powerhouse that God wants you to be for Him. And so let us be an example to our spouses and to our children. We're talking about preparing the next generation. If I am going to influence my children or my grandchildren, then I have to have some kind of spiritual leadership so that they can follow somebody. So the first thing we saw is we say prepare them by praising God for His works in our life. Secondly, we see that we need to prepare them by teaching them God's Word. What has God done for you lately? Tell them about that. Number three, I must hasten. Look at verse, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, look at verse number eight. In verse number eight it says, And might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Now look at verse number 41. We're looking at Psalm 78, verse number 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. The third thing that God teaches us here is we need to prepare the we need to pre prepare the next generation by purposing in our heart that we will not limit God. 
by purposing in our heart that we will not limit God. These people that the psalmist is alluding to is he's alluding all the way back to the children of Israel when they first came to the promised land. You remember the story, if you've read your Bible or if you've listened to preaching for very long. The children of Israel were in Egypt. They were in bondage. God miraculously took them out of bondage. He brought them to the Red Sea. He opened up the Red Sea. He allowed them to cross the Red Sea. And then when the Egyptians tried to follow them, then God killed all the Egyptian army by allowing the sea to come in and destroy them. And so they saw those great works. But what was the reason for God delivering them from Egypt? He said, I have a land for you. It's called the promised land. It's yours. I've set it aside just for you. It's called Canaan. And he says, I want you to go to Canaan. It's there. It's ready for you. I've prepared it for you. He said, it's a land filled with milk and honey. In other words, it's a prosperous land. It's a land of plenty. Many of you are immigrants from another country. I'm sure the reason why some of you, maybe all of you, came to this country is because you looked at this country as a land of opportunity. Would I be, would I be accurate in saying that? Amen. Can I get a nod or something like that <laughs> from some of you? Are you awake? <laughs> I know you're staid cat Canadians, but guess what? I've seen how you act at your hockey games. <laughs> Don't give me that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're staying. We're not like you uh, guys below the border. No, no, no. I've seen you in your uh, sports activities. <laughs> and you can get excited if you want to be. But you came here because you saw this as a land of opportunity. As a land maybe of more freedom than where you were raised. A land where you could give something better to your children. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what God said to the children of Israel. He says, I'm bringing you out of Egypt, not just to show you how great I am. I've got a land prepared for you. It's called the promised land. It's a land of opportunity. It's a land of milk and honey. But what did they do? They went from seeing the great victories of the Red Sea, but when they came to Kadesh Barnea, they sent 12 spies into the land. And those 12 spies went into the land, and when they came back, at first they said, you know, it's exactly how God said it would be. And they even brought grapes where they were so big that two men had to carry them. I'm talking about grapes. I mean, those vines were so big that one man was in the front, one man was in the back, and they were carrying the grapes of escrow. And they said, look, this is it. Look at this grape. I mean, God said it was a fruitful land. It's a fruitful land. It is a land of milk and honey. But then when they, then they said this. They said, but there are giants in the land. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's just like God said it was, but there are giants in the land. And so in order for me to teach this, take your Bibles now and go all the way back to the book of Numbers, please. This is probably the last, maybe the last point, but in Numbers is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Numbers chapter number 13. Numbers chapter number 13. <clears throat> Remember, we're talking about preparing the next generation. And this third point is we prepare the next generation by purposing in our heart that we will not limit God in our life. Because this is what the children of Israel did. They limited God in their lives. In Genesis cha or Numbers chapter number 13, beginning in verse number 26, notice the Bible says here, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them, unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So there they were positive. Look at the fruit. I mean, look, at the, look at the size of these grapes. My wife and I went to California one time, we'd never been to California before, and they brought us some grapes, and, you know, all the grapes that we've ever had were, you know, small little grapes like this in Iowa, you know, with, they were transported, imported. I mean, they brought grapes like that. I was like, good night, these are grapes, they look like plums. <laughs> They're huge. And that's what they were saying, they said, look at these grapes. In verse number 27, And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sendest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So they're positive here. It's just like God said. Milk of honey, filled with milk and honey. Just like God said. But look at verse 28. Nevertheless, 
The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people. Now look, Caleb was one of the twelve. So he's hearing all this. There were twelve of them. But here these guys are all saying, wait a second. And Caleb's thinking to himself, what are you guys talking about? This is exactly what God told us, and here you're talking negative? What is your problem? Look what he says there. And Caleb stilled the people and said, hold on, before Moses, and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Caleb said, look, God gave it to us. The land's just like God said it was. He called it the land of promise. He promised it for us. You know what, you know what Caleb was saying? He was saying, let's believe God's promises. Let's not go by what our eyes see. Let us not go by what our ears hear. Let us not go by our feelings. He says, let us believe God. God said it was ours. He promised it to us. He said it was a, milk, a, a land of milk and honey. We see that part of it true. Well, if that part is true, then his promise to give it to us is also true. So Caleb was ready to go forward. He said, basically, here's what he was saying. Would you guys shut up? <laughs> He said, well, don't listen to these guys. That's what he was saying. He says, let's go right now. He could sense, he could sense the spirit change from one of positive, from the people looking at the, the fruits of the land and saying, wow, it's just like God said. And all of a sudden, these guys start talking about, no, 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 walled cities, they're giants. I mean, these people are so strong. And he could sense the change of, of the atmosphere of the people. And so immediately he got up there. He said, don't listen to them. Let's go up right now. Let's take that land. It's a land filled with milk and honey. You see it? Let's believe God. But what did they do? Verse number 31, But the men that went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. All of a sudden they changed it. From the positive, now all of a sudden they bring up the evil report. And they said, uh, Report of the land which they had searched into the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that were saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come uh, of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So I want you to notice just these things. I probably, last, thing I'll, last point I'll talk about. What did they do? First of all, they looked at their own abilities. Verse number 31. But the men that went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They made an assessment based upon what they thought they could do. Christian, we will never go forward for God. This church will never be what God wants it to be in the future if it's filled with a bunch of Christians that all they do is look at their own abilities. It's not about our abilities. It is about our God and His abilities. It is not about our personality. It is about God and what He can do through us. It is not about us being, you know, having a super personality or us being able to speak in front of groups of people. That's, it's not about that. It's it's about do we have a God and do we have a Bible that gives us promises from God and can we claim those promises to go forward for him? That's what it's about. Friends, I should not be doing what I'm doing because I was just a pastor of a small church out in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa, 22 houses where I pastored. We did not have many people in our congregation. Maybe your pastor will never have me come back because he heard that. I don't know, but I, it doesn't matter. When I came back from seeing what was going on in Nigeria, I thought, you know what, God, if you'll use me, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I wasn't talking about my abilities. I was saying, God, I'll trust you. And if you're going to go forward for God, you've got to stop looking at just what your eyes see and what your ears hear and what your feelings are. And you just got to grab a hold of the promises of God and say, you know what? God promised I could have victory in my Christian life. Let me ask you a question. What is bothering you in your Christian life? What is holding you back in your Christian life? Are you thinking in your heart, well, I'll never have victory over this way. You got to stop listening to yourself and listen to God's word. Because God's word says we are more than conquerors through him. Are you hearing? 
God's Word says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's God's Word. That's a promise from God. So it's not about my ability. It's about His ability. So the first thing they did here is they looked at themselves and their abilities and said, we're not able to do this. We're, we're, look at verse 31 again. He says, <coughs> we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. They made an assessment. They said, they're stronger than we are. You know what? With God, all things are possible. Doesn't matter if they're stronger. It, you know, Satan is stronger than us. Listen to me. Satan is stronger than us. The Bible calls him a roaring lion. The Bible says that, you know, I mean, he obviously is stronger. He was a fallen angel. He was with God in heaven. He fell. So he is stronger than us. But you see, God says, I am more than conquerors through him. In Ephesians chapter number 6, it tells us, take on the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and having done all, to stand. What's God saying? He says, look, yes, Satan is powerful, but if you take the whole armor of God and put it on, then you can stand against his attacks. You can stand against the fiery darts of the wicked. You can stand, and after it's all said and done, you're standing for God. That's a promise from God. And so we got to stop looking at our abilities. And we got to believe God's promises. What are you struggling with? God promises you victory if you'll accept his promises. So first of all, they made the mistake of looking at their own selves. They said, man, life, we're not able to do this. Secondly, I want you to notice the second thing that they did. They limited God by their perception of the task. Look at verse number 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. I'm almost done. Just stay with me just for a little bit longer. Uh, <clears throat> they looked at the task, and they said, Man, life, this, this is too big. <laughs> he says, Man, life, they, they eat up the inhabitants of the land. He says they're stronger. And then finally, look at the third thing I want you to notice here. They limited God by their perception of themselves. Look at verse number 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. They, started, they looked at the giants and said, man, like, we're like grasshoppers. But you notice he said, in our own sight. I don't have the time to go into this, but if you were to find out, if you were to look in the Bible, when they finally did go into the land, under Joshua's leadership, you'll find out that Rahab told him these words. She said, ever since we heard about you coming across the Red Sea, he says, we were shaking it, this is modern technology, or modern vernacular, we were shaking in our boots. So when the children of Israel were saying, when these men were saying, man, life, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes, in reality, they heard about what happened in the Red Sea, and the people in the land were shaking in their boots. But they, had, they made the problem, they made the mistake of looking at themselves and saying, man, life, we can't go up against these people. We need to prepare the next generation. And God gives us some things that we should learn from in Psalm 78. Thank you so much. You've been very attentive. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you for the Word of God. Pray that you bless the service to come now. In Jesus' name, amen.